This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Shea. We turn now to the Vatican, where Pope Francis has called for swift action to save the planet from environmental ruin, urging world leaders to hear, quote, the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. Earlier today, the Vatican published the Pope's long-awaited encyclical on the environment and climate change. Pope Francis called for a change of lifestyle in rich countries steeped in a, quote, throwaway consumer culture and an end to obstructionist attitudes that sometimes put profit before the common good. Our house is going to ruin, and that harms everyone, especially the poorest. Mine is therefore an appeal for responsibility, based on the task that God has given to man in creation, till and keep the garden in which he was placed. I invite everyone to accept with open hearts this document, which follows the Church's social doctrine. Pope Francis said protecting the planet is a moral and ethical imperative for believers and non-believers alike that should supersede political and economic interests. He also dismissed those who argue that technology will solve all environmental problems and that global hunger and poverty will be resolved simply by market growth. A major th theme of the encyclical is the disparity between rich and poor. He said, quote, We fail to see that some are mired in desperate and degrading poverty with no way out, while others have not the faintest idea of what to do with their possessions, vainly showing off their supposed superiority and leaving behind them so much waste, which, if it were the case everywhere, would destroy the planet. Environmental groups have welcomed the Pope's action on climate change. Giuseppe Onofrio is the executive director of Greenpeace in Italy. As Greenpeace, we have already expressed our gratitude to His Holiness because we too see climate change as a mostly moral and ethical issue. Climate change is already happening and its effects have already been disastrous on the poorest countries and the poorest people who don't have the means to defend themselves from it. They are also part of the human population who have the least responsibility for what is happening, being that they consume less fossil fuels. So we are absolutely grateful for this encyclical that for us is a source of inspiration. We are joined now by two guests. Naomi Klein is the author of This Changes Everything, Capitalism Versus the Climate. She's been invited to speak at the Vatican, where she will speak at the People and Planet First, the Imperative to Change Course conference. She's joining us by Democracy Now! video stream from Canada. And here in New York, Nathan Schneider joins us, columnist at America Magazine, a national Catholic weekly magazine published by the Jesuits. Thank you both. Naomi, let's begin with you. Um, respond to the Pope's encyclical on climate change and the environment. Um, yes, good Good morning, Amy and, and Armin. And um, before I begin, I, I would really like to um, express my deep, deep sadness and outrage uh, at the hate crime in Charleston. This is uh, a, a grief-struck morning that we're having this conversation. Um, and it was an attack on a religious institution, which is also worth bearing in mind as well as an attack on African Americans. Um, I, you know, I think that this encyclical, we can't overstate the importance of it, uh, the impact that it will have. Um, it's hard to respond to a document that runs uh, close to 200 pages when it was just released uh, in non-draft form uh, a few hours ago. We're all still digesting it, uh, Amy, but it is very clear that a uh, door has just been opened and, and uh, a gust of wind uh, is blowing through where it is now possible to, to say some very powerful truths about the, the real implications of climate change, uh, really the root causes. And I think a lot of the discussion about the encyclical in the U.S. media cycle has focused and will continue to focus on the impact on Republicans and on climate deniers, uh, um, many of whom are Catholic. And it is certainly a challenge uh, to that demographic in the United States because the Pope is coming out so clearly on the side of climate science and saying this is real and this is happening. But I think that it's too easy to say that this is just a challenge to uh, Rick Santorum and Jeb Bush. Frankly, it is also a challenge to Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama and to large parts of the Green Movement uh, because 
It is a rebuke of slow action. It very specifically says that uh, climate denial is not just about denying the science, it's also about denying the urgency of the science. Uh, it, the, the document is very strong in condemning delays, half measures, so-called market solutions. It very specifically criticizes carbon markets, the carbon offsetting uh, as an inadequate measure that will encourage speculation and rampant consumption. And I think probably the most significant part of it, the big picture, is the foregrounding of the culture of frenetic consumption in the wealthy world and among the wealthy. And this is really significant because I think large parts of the climate change discussion tries to have it always and say, no, we just we'll just have green growth. We'll just have we'll we'll consume green products. And, uh, you know, this goes a lot deeper than that and says, no, um, we need to get at the underlying values that are feeding this culture of frenetic consumption that is entirely unsustainable. Uh, Naomi Klein, you mentioned the fact that the Pope calls repeatedly in the encyclical for radical change. I want to ask you about a specific uh, citation from the leaked document that appeared earlier this week. He said, um, in a corrupt culture, we can't believe that laws will be enough to change behaviors that affect the environment. Could you talk specifically about that, about the laws that he may be referring to there? Well, I think when he's referring to corruption, I, I believe he's referring to the influence of uh, polluting companies, of multinational corporations, which he also goes after in the encyclical. And I think this is one of the most significant things about the document. One might expect of a religious document about climate change to erase difference, right, to say, we're, well, we're all in this together, and certainly it talks about the earth as our common home, but it also recognizes explicitly the power dynamics in capitalism, which is to say that there are forces within this system that are actively working against change. And, um, and, and that is probably what he's referring to when he's talking about um, how there may be laws, but the laws aren't enforced. Um, and, you know, indeed, the, the laws are also inadequate, which is also addressed in, in, the, in the document. And it has some very specific uh, calls for you know, another level of environmental law, um, which is a part of the document that I haven't been able to look at, look at uh, um, you know, closely enough. And another thing I have to say is, you know, I am, you know, I have accepted um, this invitation to speak at a conference uh, which is about digging more deeply into the document because... Uh, there's an understanding that it does take time to digest a document of this length, this multi-layered, um, and it, it, it requires a, that kind of deeper analysis. Uh, and I think that this intervention five months ahead of the UN Climate Conference in Paris is, is tremendously significant. It's going to push political leaders to go further. It's going to be a tool for social movements. A lot of the language of the climate justice movement has just been adopted by the Pope. I mean, even phrases like ecological debt, the Pope is talking about the debt that the wealthy world owes to the poor. I mean, this is a framing that comes originally uh, from Ecuador, uh, from the movements against drilling in the Amazon. Um, and, you know, th these, these, this is a phrase that was um, you know, never heard in mainstream circles until uh, na just now, actually. I mean, I've never seen such a mainstream use of that term. So it is very important um, in that way. But I mean, I have to say on a personal level that, that um, as, as thrilled as I am that, 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 the, uh, that, the, that the Vatican is leading in this way and that this pope is leading in this way um, and bringing together the fight against poverty with uh, the, the fight to act on climate change, that doesn't mean that... Uh, there's a complete merger between the climate justice movement and the Vatican here. I mean, obviously, there are huge differences that remain over issues like marriage equality, uh, reproductive rights and freedom, uh, to name just a few. Nathan Schneider, you're a columnist with the Catholic Weekly America. Um, you've been covering Catholic engagement with climate change. Talk about the scope of this. I mean, just for people to understand what this encyclical is, the number of languages it's been released, and how large it is, and what it means for the Catholic community. Well, this is really the first third world encyclical. You know, this is coming from a pope uh, who was shaped in really significant ways by economic crisis 
seized during the Cold War in Argentina, and um, being in the middle of a battleground between uh, uh, between the first and second world powers. It was drafted by uh, a cardinal from Ghana. So this is coming from the side of the world that we don't normally hear from, and it's very much in line with things that popes have been saying for decades, um, you know, going back to Paul VI, then John Paul II, Benedict XVI. So a lot of the, the content is actually not so new for Catholics, but the emphasis and that, that, um, that, that the, the language of climate debt, the language, the recognition that there is a, a uh, divide here between the rich countries and the poor. And this is a cry from the developing world, from um, what has been labeled the third world um, for change. We're going to break, and when we come back, we'll hear uh, the words of Cardinal Peter Turkson himself of Ghana. Um, we urge you to stay with us. This is Democracy Now! Back in a minute.